Welcome to the chapter in Unit 12 in the Anatomy and Physiology 2 course. Uh, today we're going to be discussing introduction to the nervous uh, system, particularly histology uh, and some anatomy of the nervous tissue. Uh, before we get into um, other chapters in this book, where we talk about the parts of the brain, the different lobes, uh, peripheral nervous system, we just want to generally talk about what is involved in histology of the nervous tissue, how do we, under microscope in general, differentiate between different types of cells found there, support cells, main cells, uh, and see sort of what that's about. Now, um, just for illustration purposes, I've made the schematic of uh, the general kind of a very common type of a neuron, the nerve cell. So we have the main portion, that's the cell body, this is where we have all the organelles in the nucleus. <clears throat> There's all these extensions always coming out from the cell body. These are called dendrites, kind of like branches of a tree. <clears throat> and then there's always one big extension, and that is the axon. Uh, and that extension goes all the way to what's called an axon terminal, uh, where the actual neurotransmitters or chemicals are released. So if you think about the nervous tissue, one important aspect of this is keep in mind what is the function of the nervous system, and this is essentially communication, right? So when we talk about nervous tissues, nervous system, we're thinking of cells talking to each other, sending chemical messengers, electrochemical messengers often, and the way this is done is through neurons, nerve cells throughout the body, um, involving essentially pretty much every cell in the body, every organ is somehow needs to be connected to the nervous system in order to uh, uh, be controlled by the nervous system and allow messages to go through and travel far distances. Now, so for the regular parts of a neuron, again, we have the cell body, the dendrites and the axons. Uh, in the book, you'll see the illustrations for these, but essentially in the cell body, we keep in mind that this is where all the main regular components of a cell are, just like in any other cell, so the nucleus, uh, all the organelles, mitochondria, um, other organelles are all located there. Now, there are certain specific differences also in the case of a neuron, as we would expect for a specialized type of cell, of course, just like we saw, for instance, in skeletal muscle cells, cardiac muscle cells, others, is that uh, instead of having a regular cytoskeletal system, those uh, proteins that we know, like microtubules, in order to support the organelles and allow movements of molecules throughout the cell, a uh, neuron has neurofilaments, and these actually allow the newly formed neurotransmitters to kind of go sort of like uh, rail tracks, okay, throughout the cell body in order to eventually merge into the axon and travel all the way down to the axon terminal, right? So neurofilaments allow the newly formed <clears throat> neurotransmitters, right, those chemical messengers, to actually be able to travel uh, through the neuron to where it needs to be released at the synapse or the axon terminal, uh, which we're going to talk about soon. And another helpful way to think of the cell bodies is that sometimes we have multiple um, basically uh, cell bodies, and if we have multiple cell bodies aggregating together, uh, kind of doing a similar function inside the central nervous system. We call that a nucleus or nuclei if it's multiple. Uh, and if it's in the peripheral nervous system, such as in the like dorsal root ganglia, uh, sort of in the back, uh, then we call that ganglia, right? So again, so CNS means central nervous system, PNS is peripheral nervous system. If it's central nervous system, like in the brain, um, we call that collection of cell bodies, we call it a nuclei. Uh, if it's in peripheral nervous system, we call it a ganglia. Uh, and you might see this in the book and illustration, sometimes with actual specific examples. Uh, but keep in mind, these are just essentially collection of cell bodies. Now, for the dendrites, these are extensions <clears throat> coming out from the cell body. Dendrites are essentially just branches like of a tree. That's why they were called like that. That's what they look like. They extend out in every direction. Many neurons have multiple of these dendrites, sometimes hundreds of them even. And what they are, are those areas of the neuron that always only receive messages, right? So the axon sends the message when it releases a neurotransmitter, a dendrite receives a message, okay? 
And so basically, if this, for instance, neuron was receiving a message from a different neuron, then an axon terminal will be kind of touching on the dendrite here or here in the other locations, but only at the dendrites because dendrites receive the message. <clears throat> and the last part, like I said, the axon terminal, like we kept saying again, right, this is the portion that has the synapse, that has that connection, where finally the chemicals could be released and they will bind to the receptors on the other end, right, at the other cell, either the, the neuron or like a muscle cell or something else, and then that will activate and send that signal finally to the next cell. Now, there's also uh, another way of thinking about this is that we have different types of neurons, uh, and they're found throughout the body, both in the central and peripheral nervous system. Again, uh, keep in mind that central nervous system is essentially the brain, and um, <clears throat> spinal cord, peripheral nervous system is all the other nerves involved. So going to your fingers, to your toes, all the other organs in body, that's the peripheral nervous system. <clears throat> so generally, whether you're looking at the brain or other parts of the body, uh, we have many different types of neurons. The three main ones that are discussed in the book that we can talk about today is the most common one is the multipolar type of neuron, which is basically, this is what it would look like, right? The one that has multiple dendrites and one big axon extending out all the way down to the axon terminal. That's the multipolar type of neuron. This is the one we find pretty much everywhere in the body uh, and very, very common, but there's also some others. And each type of neuron has been selected due to specialized anatomical features that it has or the sort of uh, more convenient way, the way it can generate the signal or send that information as part of communication. So two unique types that are much less common is the bipolar type of neuron and the pseudo-unipolar neuron. The bi bipolar neuron essentially is the neuron that um, you see basically uh, is located primarily in the retina of the eye. We will talk about the eye anatomy uh, in a few chapters, and this is going to be one of these important neurons that transmits actually light information in the retina, which is in the back of the eye, where the photoreceptors are, uh, to allow the brain right, actually receive that information to interpret it as the image that we see, right, for eyesight, for vision. So again, bipolar neuron located in the retina of the eye, also has some other locations, but this is the most important one for us for now. <coughs> And another type of neuron <clears throat> is a pseudo-unipolar type of neuron. <clears throat> and this is the one that has two axons. And basically, uh, the best location for this one would be for us, like just in terms of the example, is in the skin, we have those neurons that transmit pain and temperature sensation. They run along the same nerve fibers. And uh, the specifically, the name for these neurons, again, that transmit pain and temperature sensation are called pseudo-unipolar type of neurons. Yet in the book, you will see what they look like in illustrations. Uh, so it's going to be hopefully a little bit easier to kind of remember, you know, uh, what they're about. And then the last portion, the synapse, the synapse is that connection, like I said before, from between one neuron and the next. So like between the axon terminal and one neuron and the dendrite of the neuron, there's actually, there's space there, something called a synaptic cleft. Okay, so the neurons are never actually touching each other, but through that space, uh, the chemicals will be released, right? So the chemicals released here are called neurotransmitters. These are chemicals like serotonin, that we think of when we think of mood and happiness and affect, and depression. Uh, chemicals like dopamine, which have to do with uh, addiction, pleasurable behaviors, uh, reward centers in the brain. So things like Parkinson's, psychosis, and acetylcholine, which we talked about before, which is a very common uh, electrolyte, especially, um, sorry, neurotransmitter that deals with, obviously, musculoskeletal system, but also is involved in the brain and plays a role from everything from learning and memory to problems with Alzheimer's and other conditions and disorders. And there are many, many other neurotransmitters as well. We might talk about some of them later. Uh, but essentially, any kind of neurotransmitter would be released by a neuron. They have very specific receptors 
Each neurotransmitter has multiple different receptors designated for it in the brain and other parts of the body. And the nerve that releases the neurotransmitter is called the presynaptic neuron. And the one that picks up the neurotransmitter from its receptors is the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, right. Now, we also want to talk about here what kind of support cells exist to help um, the nervous system function, right? So we have to keep in mind that neurons, right, these different types of cells, are actually very large cells, uh, very complex cells. They do not undergo normal subdivision usually. And during their lifetime, they basically need a lot of help to survive. They need vascular support. They need nutritional support. They often need even physical support to be held up. So those cells that do that are called oligodendrocytes. Uh, oligo, um, they're called neuroglial cells. Okay, oligodendrocytes is one of the types. But so neuroglial cells, we're going to talk about next. On this side, we see basically neuroglial cells, also called glial cells. Glia is actually like glue, right? That kind of uh, connects and glues everything together. So the best way to categorize neuroglial cells, because there's so many different kinds and it's easy to kind of get sort of tripped up or confused with them, is that we can say there's some neuroglial cells that are found in the peripheral nervous system and some neuroglial cells that are found in the central nervous system. Again, there are many different kinds. There's some hundreds of them that have been discovered. For us, we're just going to talk about just a few of them here. So two from the peripheral nervous system and about three from the central nervous system. For the peripheral nervous system, uh, the most common ones are the Schwann cells and the satellite cells. Schwann cells are particularly important here. So as you have probably read already and seen before, uh, in order to allow fast and uh, kind of uh, efficient communication through the axon, the axon often needs to be wrapped in fatty covering called myelin. And somebody needs to provide that myelin. So in case of the peripheral nerves, this myelin is generated by the Schwann cells that literally uh, are connected and kind of wrapped around the axons in the peripheral nervous system. And the myelin then protects, insulates, and speeds up the neuronal conduction through that cell. There are some axons that are unmyelinated or basically do not have that fatty substance on top of them and some that uh, quite a lot of them that do have the myelin. When myelin is found again in the peripheral nervous system, we know that that has been provided to us by these specialized neuroglial cells called Schwann cells. Um, now in other areas, like we talked about dorsal root ganglia that I mentioned, uh, so remember ganglia are those cell bodies, uh, all aggregating together in the peripheral nervous system, they're called ganglia. And who is going to support that ganglia? But right? again, we need another uh, support cell. And in this case, they're called satellite cells. They support the ganglia uh, in the peripheral nervous system. For the central nervous system, uh, there's quite a bit of more variety, right? The central nervous is more complex, obviously, with the brain and all the many facets of the brain and the abilities and everything. Uh, so the overall complexity lends itself to a more complex flame work for the support cells as well. Uh, and uh, the three mo uh, one of the three most important types of support cells here are the astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and the ependymal cells. Uh, now, the astrocytes, basically astro means star, so they have like star-like shape. Uh, these cells are found everywhere in the brain, in the central nervous system. Uh, their job primarily is to provide an anchor to the neurons, right? They're physically holding onto the neurons, physically supporting them. They provide also vascular support. They make sure that capillaries and other blood vessels are located close by to the neurons to ensure that they get all the nutrients, the glucose and the oxygen and all the other nutrients that neurons need to survive, right? Very, very important function here. And also something that, uh, is extremely important to realize is that the brain serves as one of these immune privilege sites and this is only one of just a couple in the body that exists where molecules that are traveling through the bloodstream cannot simply have an open access to the brain right we have created something called a blood brain barrier which is essentially astrocytes wrapping around uh, capillaries and are constantly watching 
and doing this job of surveillance, of checking what is traveling through the blood as it's trying to enter the brain and making sure that molecules that are toxic or dangerous or poisonous to the brain would not be able to enter as not to harm, obviously, the delicate neurons. All right, so when we see blood-brain barrier, we are talking about astrocytes connected to specialized capillaries to ensure that there is this constant physical and molecular, essentially, barrier that is responsible for making sure that molecules cannot simply have a free pass and just simply go through into the brain. Right? This is extremely useful in normal conditions, but becomes a problem sometimes uh, when a certain pharmaceutical or a medication needs to enter the brain but cannot because of its chemical uh, makeup and where essentially it is unable to bypass this barrier and so this creates a, a challenge for uh, drug developers that need to then figure out how to sort of uh, trick the brain in order to accepting that medication. This could be right for something like treating like a brain tumor or other very important conditions that very hard to treat, partially because of this barrier. Uh, two other cells that exist here are, uh, one is basically for the myelin production, like we talked about here with the Schwann cell, inside the brain in the nervous system, in the central nervous system, we have an oligodendrocyte. Um, and this is a, uh, a cell that, again, kind of wraps around the axons of the brain to myelinate those, uh, those accents to speed up conduction, right, to insulate the cells, just like the myelin did here. Again, the only difference, the name of the cells are different because one is located in the periphery and one is in the central area, such as the brain, okay? And the last type of cell is called the ependymal type of cell, and this is a cell found in the ventricles of the brain. These are ciliated cells. They're responsible for producing cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. This is the liquid that bathes the brain and the spinal cord constantly. Uh, it's sort of like this um, cushion to resist the impacts that the brain might have upon hitting the skull in case of trauma. So just like the baby was surrounded by the amniotic fluid uh, during gestation in the mother, in the uterus, the brain is always surrounded by this liquid to cushion any impact, to protect it, and also have so a way to remove some of the waste and other material. Right. One of the important ways that we can access this CSF is by doing a lumbar puncture, which is done in the uh, between L4, L5 lumbar vertebra in the back. Uh, so this large needle is inserted um, into the subarachnoid space to withdraw some of the CSF. And this we can look under a microscope, send it to the lab and investigate in case if we're suspecting something like meningitis or other infections in the brain. And it's just a very useful way to kind of see internally inside there without doing surgery or any kind of a more invasive procedures. So this is unit 12. Please make sure to read this chapter, look at the notes uh, and study this material.